Welcome back to Going Deeper. This is our third segment in our new series on contending for the faith uh, based out of the book of Jude. So far, we've learned that this text has a, a military style feel to it, and we've developed a summary sentence that helps us to get at the heart of what Jude is saying in the opening verses. Now, that sentence for us so far has, has read this way, that we are called to stand firm on the truth of the gospel. Now, in the last segment, we began to identify the sides in this spiritual conflict that Jude is describing for us. Jude introduced to us in verses 1 and 2 the army of truth who has its commander who is Jesus. You and I are its soldiers. We've been provided everything and anything that we need and we've been provided with those things in abundance. And our orders could not be clear. We are to contend earnestly for the faith. Give it everything that we've got. And now we move to verse 4 where Jude begins to introduce to us the other side in this spiritual conflict, and that is the enemies of the truth. On the one hand, it is true to say we have one enemy, and that enemy is Satan, but Satan has many servants. Now, some serve him consciously. Others do so unknowingly. But the ones that Jude is going to describe for us are the ones that are serving him consciously. They know exactly what they're doing. You'll notice that he says in verse 4, Certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Certain people, he says. It's purposefully vague. He doesn't mention names, and he doesn't doesn't really want to. Rather than mentioning names and identifying people, that could could be reserved to his audience and his time, he begins rather to describe behaviors so that the enemies of truth could not only be identified in the first century, but in any century. He says that these people have crept in. They, They didn't walk in, putting their agenda out there in front of everyone. They crept in through secrecy and deception. He says that they have come in unnoticed, hiding their true agenda that they are ungodly. They are literally unlike God. That would seem to indicate, since Jesus is God, that they are also not Christian. They're pretending to be, but in reality they are not because they are not Christ-like. And they pervert the grace of the gospel. Notice what it says there. Who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. They take the the wondrous gift of salvation by grace and they twist it. They twist it into a license to sin. They would say something like, well, we're saved. So God who loves us so much that He saved us surely wouldn't restrict us with laws and rules. After all, we're not under the law. We're under grace. Well, in many ways, We are not under the law. We are under grace. But to take that idea and to somehow twist it, uh, that's the message of liberal Christianity even today. This message is given to us in the sense that anything that restricts our personal freedoms to do what we want has to be labeled horribly as legalism. And that's how we arrive at people who call themselves Christian that approve of things like same-sex marriage, drunkenness, no-fault divorce, and abortion on demand. Now, how how do they do that? How, how How can you read the Scripture and then be okay with the things that the Bible, that ultimately God says, is not okay? Well, Jude tells us. They deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. And let me back up just a little bit because he talks about how they pervert the grace of our God and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. And the idea there has to do with authority. Master and Lord are emphasized repeated terms that are terms of authority. These people deny God's authority by twisting His words to match their own desires. Today, this shows up in in Christian circles as what I call trajectory theology. 
Now, what do I mean by trajectory theology? Well, let me give you a classic example. A few years ago, I engaged in a conversation with a thoroughgoing liberal Christian. I use those terms loosely. We got into a debate about same-sex marriage. And I simply asked him, I said, how is it that you can call yourself a Christian and disagree with Christ on the definition of marriage? Because in Matthew 19, Jesus said that in the beginning, God created them male and female, and the two shall become one flesh. It's very clear how Jesus defined marriage. And the man responded to me, he said, well, if, if you've read the Sermon on the Mount, you know how that Jesus encountered the Pharisees who had, who had said different things than had been said before. And Jesus used that frame, famous phrase, well, you have heard it said in old time, but now I say to you. I said, yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. And he said, well, I just believe that if Jesus were alive today on the earth, that same-sex marriage would be one of those issues that he would say, well, you heard it said in old time that, that it wasn't supposed to be that way, but now I say to you. And what he's saying is, we, we put doctrine on a trajectory, that it means one thing in one point of history, but it's on a trajectory to change its meaning over time. Now that kind of argument really has a couple of fatal flaws to it. First of all, it introduces conflicting meanings in what the Bible teaches. And ultimately, that means there is no objective truth. There's nothing that is true today, yesterday, and forever. And what this guy didn't really realize is he's got a first century Jesus disagreeing with his 21st century version of Jesus. How is it possible that Jesus disagrees with himself? Another fatal flaw in this argument, this trajectory theology, is that it puts us as human beings in charge of telling the Bible what the Bible means for us today. If the Bible doesn't mean what it actually says, then who should get to decide what it means now? Well, that's obviously left up to you and I, right? Well, this is Satan's oldest trick in the book, just wearing 21st century clothes. He's been doing the same thing since the Garden of Eden. Questioning God's authority by questioning God's Word. You remember his famous phrase in Genesis 3, 1, where he says to Eve, Has God really said? Well, that's exactly what people are, are doing now by taking what the Bible clearly teaches and say, Well, that's not exactly what it means anymore. And this rejection of the rightful authority of God to tell us what He wants us to know in His book is exactly why Jude says of these people in verse 4 that they were long ago destined for this condemnation. Now, what does that mean? Well, and really, really to understand that, we're going to need to head off to the Blue Letter Bible again, our favorite online resource. Again, a free trusted online resource that's loaded with lots of helpful tools. So again, open that web browser and we're going to take you to Blue Letter Bible. I've already got that pulled up on my screen here. If you don't have it on yours, just type in blueletterbible.org on your search bar and it'll take you right to the screen that you see. Now, if you go to your quick search bar here and just put, it, put in Jude 4 and hit the little green search icon, it's going to pull up Jude 4 at the beginning, and you'll see 5 and 6 and 7, and it breaks down all of the verses for you. This verse-by-verse -verse breakdown of the chapter has this little tools icon to the left of each verse. We're going to click on the one that's to the left of Jude 4, and we're going to go to our favorite tab, which is our interlinear tab. Once we get there, we're going to scroll down, and we're going to find the phrase that we're looking for, and that's this phrase, have crept in unnoticed. And we're going to also take a look at who were long before marked out. So uh, let's take a look at this one first. So this is the Strong's number G4270. And you'll see that just to the right of beforehand marked out. Now I realize the, the phrasing there in our interlinear is a little bit different than it is in the English Standard Version, but it's, it's easy enough to find. So if we click on our Strong's number, it's going to take us to this in-depth word study on uh, this, this word that we've just looked up. Now, if we scroll down here to our outline of biblical uses, we'll see the, the little snippets, the summary of the different ways that this Greek word is used throughout the Bible. 
Now, if we then scroll down to our Thayer's Greek lexicon, uh, we're going to see what we're looking for. Um, now, I'm going to jump to uh, our scripture reference and go to Jude 4 just to get exactly where we need to be. And I'm going to pull it back down. And notice what it says. It says that in Jude 4, that first definition of this Greek word represented by the 4270 number is to write down before. And it's used in Romans 15 verse 4. You can see that there. Uh, it's used in Ephesians 3.3. 3. But it is to, uh, it's written down of old, set forth, or designated beforehand. And then notice this phrase. In the scriptures of the Old Testament and the prophecies of Enoch. Did you, did you catch that? I, we, we get the scriptures of the Old Testament part, but what in the world are the prophecies of Enoch? What, what does that mean? Well, that, that brings us to, to two really important questions. What does Jude 4, a New Testament verse, have to do with the Old Testament? And, and our context is going to bear that out because Jude is going to begin to give us multiple Old Testament examples of how God judges unrepentant uh, rebels. And we'll get to that in the verses that come later. But let's talk about what this, this second important question. What in the world are the prophecies of Enoch? I mean, we barely know anything about Enoch to begin with. What we do know about him, we find in Genesis chapter 5. We know that he was the father of Methuselah. We know that in Genesis 5.24, it said of Enoch that he walked with God and he was not, for God took him. He was the first man in all of history to be translated to heaven. But that's about all we know. There are no prophecies of Enoch that are recorded in the Old Testament. So what is this Thayer's Greek lexicon talking about? And, and how is it that Jude, who uh, apparently quotes from the book of Enoch in verses 14 and 15 of his letter, how is it that he knows about them? All great questions, and that's why we're going to dig deeper. That's why we're going deeper to figure out what's, what's happening here with this little phrase. So if you go searching through your Bible for the book of Enoch, you're not going to find it. It's not listed in the 66 books that you'll find in your Bible. Jude is quoting from a source that isn't in the Bible. He's quoting from something that's outside of the Bible. Now, I, I know that's strange. And the first time that you hear about something like that, it feels uncomfortable, but, it, but it's true. Just like today, there, there were back in the first century and even centuries prior to that, lots of religious books that were written about spiritual things that weren't the Bible. Our, our religious bookstores, our, our Bible stores all across the country are filled with these kind of books written by David Jeremiah, or written by Billy Graham, or written by this one or that one. They're great books and they're very helpful, but we all would agree that they're not the Bible. They're not on the same level of authority. They're not divinely inspired, but they're not necessarily incorrect either. So that's really what we've got going on here. I mean, think about it. At this moment in time, you and I are using Thayer's Greek lexicon as an authoritative resource. But we both know that Thayer's lexicon isn't on par with Scripture in its authority, but that doesn't automatically make it incorrect either. So just keep that in mind. Jude is obviously familiar with this book of Enoch. Uh, he used a paragraph from it in his letter, and we'll talk about that when we get to verses 14 and 15. And since Jude is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit didn't stop Jude from using this idea from the book of Enoch, then we can trust that what is reported here in, in the Scripture in verses 14 and 15 are indeed true. But now, let's, let's leave verses 14 and 15 for a little bit later when we get there. Let's get back to the main point. The main point here is that Jude, already in these early verses, is being influenced by something outside of the Bible, the book of Enoch. And therefore, it makes sense to apply a book of Enoch-like definition to Jude's usage of the phrase in verse 5, they were designated for this condemnation. So it just seems, seems clear that however it's used there in the book of Enoch is probably how Jude intends to use it here. And that's all we really need to know about it at this point. Now, we also need to be careful here. 
It doesn't say they were destined to be rebels. They didn't have a choice. God forced them into that. Otherwise, what guilt would they have? Is a puppet accountable for how the puppet master pulls the strings? Of course not. So what does it say? Well, what it says is their condemnation, their punishment for their choice to turn away from the truth and rebel against God's authority was established a long time ago. This makes their choice all the more horrific because they knew what the price would be before they ever chose this, and they chose it anyway. Now, how in the world could someone be so blind? Well, the answer, they willfully choose to sin. And willfully choosing to sin is like choosing to put on a blindfold. It, it invites and increases our trouble. If someone questions the authority, the absolute truthfulness of God's Word, then doesn't that mean that they are serving the enemy? Doesn't that mean that, that we shouldn't listen to them? They're blind. And blind leaders are not good leaders. This is the beginning of the picture that Jude uses for us as enemies of the truth. Now, let me just pull this together with a, a brief illustration. Now, if you saw this sign hanging on a, a gate outside of someone's house, you would probably know what it meant. But you would find this sign completely and utterly meaningless if you had no idea what a dog was. If you, if you had never seen a dog, let's say you came from another planet, you didn't have any idea what a dog was or what a dog could do, you would have no idea what this sign meant because you'd have no idea what a dog was. You wouldn't be able to identify it in order to beware of it, and you wouldn't have any idea what you should beware of. How are you going to know if the animal that's approaching you is a dog or a squirrel? And if you don't know that dogs can bite, then your primary concern might be getting hit with its tail. Kind of works the same with us. That's why books like Jude are so important. He introduces for us the enemies of the truth. He puts them on display and he says, this is what they're like so that you and I can identify them. And he lets us know what their tactics are. And their tactics are to deny the authority of God and the reliability of His Word. And that's why you and I are called to stand firm on the truth of the gospel. But in order to do so, we have to be able to identify the truth by studying it, and we have to listen to teaching with a critical ear. And we have to speak up when a false version of the truth is proclaimed and live out the truth in our daily lives. Join me next time as we begin to further examine those examples from the Old Testament that we bumped up against a few moments ago. We'll be looking at verses 5 through verse 8 and on into verse 10. I hope you'll join me then on Going Deeper. Thanks for being here, and we'll see you next time.